session three on competition between PROs for songwriters and publishers, which will be moderated by my colleague Owen Kendler, who is the chief of the media entertainment and professional services section at the antitrust division. Please take it away, Owen. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, obviously, the, the sessions today were been quite lively, and that's great. Uh, this third session is going to be on a slightly different topic than the session that preceded us this morning and the session that will occur tomorrow uh, morning. Um, so today we have a great group of panelists. I'll let, let them introduce themselves individually uh, once I provide kind of an overview of what we're up to. Um, you know, today on this panel, we're going to discuss competition between the pros to offer their services to songwriters, composers, and publishers. Uh, how the ASCAP and BMI decrees affect that competition and whether the membership provisions in the decrees, in particular the ASCAP decree, should be modified. Should they be changed in some way to protect, strengthen, or maybe let competition do what it, what it may do? Um, earlier, uh, Michelle Lewis in her opening comments mentioned that it's important uh, for songwriters to work with a PRO of, of their choice. And we're going to discuss that choice during this panel and how the decrees affect that choice. So in particular, I mean, there, there are a few components of that, but in particular, the panelists will discuss and debate the requirements and decree that, for example, um, pre require uh, the pros to accept all songwriters not just turn them away. Uh, limits on how long it can make a writer or a publisher stay as members of the pro. And uh, we'll also discuss how license is in effect and how the resignation process might affect the ability for songwriters to change pros and work with the pro of their choice. Um, so I'll let people introduce themselves and we'll just go in order as, as the agenda laid it out. So I'll start with, I'll turn to Clara to introduce herself and then Danielle, Jordan, Mark, and Jack. Hi, I'm Clara Kim, and I'm the Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and Head of Business and Legal Affairs for ASCAP. Um, I want to thank you, Owen, and the department for inviting me and the other panelists to participate in this conversation today. And thanks to Pharrell for such an a inspirational keynote. Thank you, Clara. Danielle? Sorry, had to unmute. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Uh, I'm Danielle Aguirre. I'm the General Counsel and Executive Vice President at the National Music Publishers Association. And um, I echo Clara in saying thank you to the Department of Justice for putting this very important workshop together. Um, really happy to be able to participate. So Jordan? Mm -hmm. Hey, honest. everybody. Okay, cool. Hey, everybody. Um, hope I sound okay. My name is Jordan Bromley. I am on the board of directors for Music Artists Coalition. Uh, we represent all facets of creators in the music business. I'm also the head of the entertainment transactional and finance group of Manat, Phelps & Phillips. So we represent hundreds of songwriters from the first song to the biggest song. And uh, amen to what Pharrell said. I'm glad I got to catch that. And thanks all. And Owen, thank you for all the work you've done on this, on setting this up. Sure. Um, Bart, I see you're on as well. Uh, I'm Bart Herbison, Executive Director of the Nashville Songwriters Association International. So again, thank you, Owen. Thanks to General Del Rahim, General Barr. This is very, very important in our ecosystem, and you've uh, been examining these issues for a long time, and we're looking forward to continuing that process. So thanks for having us all. And finally, uh, Jack from Sona. Hey, everybody. I'm Jack Hugel. I'm a songwriter and producer, and I'm also a board member uh, and co-advocacy chair for Songwriters of North America. All right. Well, that's our panel. Um, so to get, kick things off, I'll start with a question to Clara. So we heard earlier today uh, mention of the four core principles in the skinny decree proposal that ASCAM BMI have uh, put forth. Uh, Based on the public documents, it seems they're silent on membership requirements. So maybe you could walk us through what the proposal is regarding membership provisions and the decrees and, and why any changes. Sure, but if you don't mind, um, in the last uh, panel discussion, Mike Steinberg was asked about Songview, and 
uh, said he wasn't the expert and uh, it was at, requested that uh, someone in the follow-up, uh, you know, provide more information and I've been asked to do that. So um, what Songview will do is provide music users with an authoritative view of ownership shares in the vast majority of all music licenses in the United States, which is through ASCAP and BMI. The Songview technology will be based, uh, will be integrated into the ASCAP and BMI databases to seamlessly display detailed aggregated ownership data for more than 20 million musical works in our combined repertories, um, including a breakdown of shares by PRO, and the information will be accessible on both sites. Um, I also want to remind that uh, currently, um, and since um, I think it was 2016, ASCAP and BMI have already included uh, the percentage of licensable shares on their websites, as well as a uh, writer, publisher, um, for uh, each of their nearly 20 million registrations um, and the databases are searchable. So that's well, all. Mike I also, uh, sorry, but Mike mentioned that it's not quite a database, it's a reconciliation engine. What does that mean? What is the distinction? Uh, ASCAP and BMI each have their own websites. We, they, they have different names and you can search the ones that are registered in each uh, ERO through that website. Um, what Songview is, is a separate technology that takes the data that's already displayed um, on each of the separate websites and reconciles the data to identify where there may be a conflict. If uh, ASCAP uh, says that it has 50% of a song and BMI says it has 75% of that same song, um, it will be flagged as a conflict and then work will be done to, uh, to reconcile uh, who, who had the right data with the wrong data, what the source of the conflict was, and um, correct the information and then make that viewable on each of the two websites. So if you're looking um, from the perspective of wanting to know what ASCAP, so uh, what songs are covered by the ASCAP license, you will be able to see what the ASCAP information is as well as what the reconciled information is. Will, will this database have information of fractions and who else a user should go to to obtain the additional licenses needed to perform? Yes, uh, it will. Uh, but again, uh, you know, we think it will be highly uh, correct, but the actual society that controls uh, a composition or a, an artist, uh, songwriter, I'm sorry, um, and controls shares may or may not be right unless they actually participate in this, in this endeavor. And, and are people are users, publishers, or anybody beta testing these databases to work with the societies? At this point, it's not ready for uh, beta testing uh, outside of the organizations. It has been quality, it's being quality assured within the organizations. Um, but as part of the discovery and part of why this project has taken so long is that um, our respective product teams did do conduct uh, interviews with users uh, to talk about, you know, uh, the user interface and other functionality. Well, I know this isn't quite the topic for this panel, but, but thank you, Clara. Um, before we move on, does anybody else on the panel want to address the database issue? All right, hearing none. All right, so Clara, do you want to walk us through uh, how the membership provisions relate to the four, four principles and why? <laughs> why sure. First, I want to make, uh, make it clear that ASCAP and BMI are not asking for the immediate termination of the decrees. There seems to be some confusion about that. Um, so I want to make that clear and instead, you know, give some background about what our proposal is. Um, we're proposing that the existing arcane and idiosyncratic decrees that exist um, be replaced with a mo more modern decrees that have the same substance for both ASCAP and BMI. Right now, um, the different decrees contain a lot of differences that cause um, significant confusion for uh, stakeholders. Um, as you heard in the earlier panel, there's certain things that are in the ASCAP decree, they're not in the, the BMI decree, uh, things that have gotten integrated into the marketplace and nobody quite knows where that uh, restriction or obligation came from. So we think at a minimum, uh, the decrees need to be harmonized. 
Um, then uh, also, as uh, the Assistant Attorney General said at the outset of the workshop, um, you know, ASCAP and BMI didn't uh, ask for this uh, review of the consent decrees. Um, it was the Department of Justice uh, announcing that they would embark on a um, wide ranging review of all the ex existing out uh, long standing decrees and seek to get out of the business of regulating um, market players. Um, and in that context, uh, we heard strenuously from the licensee community that they would not agree to a an immediate termination. And in an effort to build a consensus and um, set a path so that the entire industry can move towards a free market, um, we agreed uh, on a proposal where we would agree to maintain four key protections that the licensees told us that they need to be able to continue to effectively license from ASCAP and BMI. Um, you know, the, our expectation is that this decree will be in place for a transitional period, um, a number of years uh, that probably the DOJ will decide since uh, the PROs and the licensees are not likely to agree since we want it to be as short as possible and they want it to be as long as possible. Um, but in any event, we'd expect it to be less than 10 years since that's the modern policy at uh, DOJ for the maximum length of uh, consent decrees. Um, but the idea is that during the transitional period, all stakeholders will make the changes that are necessary so that the uh, li music licensing marketplace can um, operate effectively and robustly uh, when the decrees are eventually uh, terminated. Um, so the four protections that you know Mike O'Neill talked about earlier are one that the PROs would continue um, to take non-exclusive rights, allowing their members to uh, license directly, freely. Um, that the uh, that, that all uh, users could get a license on request. Uh, we'd be preserving the rate court to resolve rate disputes, and uh, we would preserve the alternative forms of licenses. And uh, by the way, the law uh, that has been previously established that um, addresses uh, those forms of licenses, including genuine choice. Um, our proposal is that all of the other um, mis the other provisions, including the membership rules, would be removed, and instead the forces of competition would govern. So, um, so why uh, remove all the provisions for membership? Because we think that they're no longer necessary. Uh, whatever uh, the original rationale was uh, no longer exists, and uh, we you know, have a profoundly different reality today uh, with extreme competition with PROs, particularly among um, PROs for uh, soliciting and engaging new members. Um, we believe that uh, we will be more responsive to be able to address the needs of uh, music creators and music users if we don't have uh, arcane restrictions and we're able to do what they what makes sense for the marketplace. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can can we check our phones and, and put them on silent? Is the ding is taking me out? I apologize. Sure. That's okay. um, Daniel, right. did you want to respond to what Clara's been saying? Uh, yeah, thanks, Owen. Um, I you know I think it's uh, promising to hear Clara say that that ASCAP. Um, and, and BMI, you know, support kind of Department of Justice getting out of the business of regulating um, free market players. Um, NMPA and, and our music publisher members and songwriters could not agree more. Um, but, you know, I think that freedom from regulation has to begin with looking at the copyright owners and creators and modifying the decrees to permit them to have choice in terms of withdrawing digital performance rights and negotiating licenses in a free market first. Um, and, uh, you know, why am I raising, again, selective digital withdrawal about, you know, on this panel? I think it's because I, I would submit that, um, 
you know, before we consider uh, changes to the consent decrees that alleviate regulation on ASCAP and BMI, we have to look at the fact that a market that would provide freedom from regulation to billion dollar global digital companies and to large PRO collectives, but continue to restrict the music publishers and songwriters that own the creative works uh, could not really be a properly functioning market. Um, when, when Clara speaks of modifying decrees to ensure kind of a core principles and less regulation over membership requirements, um, means greater freedoms for ASCAP and BMI as corporate entities, right? Mike O'Neill and Beth and others today have said repeatedly that the timing isn't right uh, to provide music publishers and songwriters with necessary freedom to make their own choices to selectively withdraw. But respectfully, I think that's an easy argument to make when they're not your rights or your freedom to negotiate. Um, I think the PROs have submitted a modified decree that strips all regulations that are placed on them away. Um, but we need to keep our eye on the ball and ensure that freedom from regulation begins with music publishers and creators that were never subject to antitrust enforcement to begin with. Um, and I think we have to remember as we go into this discussion today that less regulation for ASCAP and BMI does not necessarily ensure the same market freedom for their member publishers and writers, and doesn't necessarily make it easier to, for instance, move from one PRO to another, to transfer catalogs efficiently, to be more transparent about understanding things like licenses and effect. Um, I think the fact that the PROs are strongly pushing for modifications that result in some less regulation for themselves, but continue to oppose as untimely changes that allow greater market freedom for copyright owners, to me, raises some serious questions. Um, and so I, I hope that we can continue to think about that as we go through our discussion today. And as you know, David Israelite, uh, the CEO of NMPA, said earlier today, um, while if we can speak together um, for modifications to the consent decree that allow for freedom of music publishers and writers to withdraw and negotiate in a free market their own unregulated performance rights at the same time that we discuss these types of modifications, then I think we can be supportive of what ASCAP and BMI are proposing. But until that time, I think it would be hard to support that. Uh, uh, Jordan, I see you, you raised your hand. Did you want to jump in here? Well, I don't want to, I think Bart's next. I'll go after Bart. Okay, Bart? <laughs> Well, in, you know, we generally support the four-point plan. I know there's many questions today that um, where I'll get more specific on it, and I'll accrue to Jordan here because a lot of what I want to say, I think, is on the next question we're going to ask. Okay, so Jordan. Yeah, sure. I, I would um, I would love to add a couple pillars to the four pillars, at least one or two that relate directly to songwriters. Um, I understand that. Um, you know, they, but by stripping uh, the decrees of all membership obligations and ostensibly rights, you know, that will affect songwriters. So I just kind of want to start. My first, my first comment is we like the system as it is. Um, I don't think we really need it to change. Um, it's going well. Uh, the collections are higher than ever. Uh, it's a working ecosystem. And anything that's working right now, in today's economy and world is something we should cherish because I've got a lot of members and a lot of clients who are really struggling and their writer share is their legacy. It's their annuity. It's what they give to their children. It's what they can rely upon. And any tinkering of that, any, any diminution or, or delay of their receipt of that is very scary. Um, so, that's all I'll say for now, and I'll chime in on other questions. Sorry, I was on mute. So the decrees, in part, require, as I mentioned earlier, the pros, or as can be my at least, to take all songwriters. So maybe you could, actually, Jordan, since you're on, maybe you could talk about why that's important. Why is it important for the PROs to accept songwriters? And, Absolutely. Um, and and why it, should it continue? Yeah, sure. Happy to. Um, so I have the unique experience of also having been a, uh, a manager 
of of young writers uh, in in my days before a lawyer, and uh, both ASCAP and BMI were instrumental in uh, the early days of a writer's career, uh, kind of the first port of call, as it were. They have membership membership services departments that are amazing, um, uh, uh, very open, engaging. Um, they have showcases that that our artists can play at to showcase their talent, whether it's acoustic or electric. Uh, they have email uh, blasts that go to music supervisors where they talk about new groups that they love. Um, they are they are the, the, the companies that new artists and writers think of first. And for a new artist and writer to go to one of those companies and their first response is a rejection, um, I think that could be a devastating blow to uh, a, what could be a beautiful and, and big career for that writer. Um, you know, and I think that goes to the, the initial part of the question is what do ASCAP and BMI do for new writers? So they do a lot. Um, and then, you know, if, if you get to just the mechanics of licensing and the, um, the uh, uh, security that licensees need, because we are in an ecosystem and we do need to consider uh, very highly their needs, which I believe, you know, ASCAP and BMI do in a good way in their four pillars. Um, you know, if, if ASCAP and BMI can, can reject a songwriter and they have nowhere to go, their share is not licensed. And if their share is not licensed, um, there's nowhere to license it. So it's, it's, it's a hard, it, it adds to the um, kind of peril of, of, of the licensing regime uh, in, 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 in a certain effect. Well, Jack, um, just to follow up on that, you can weigh in, but also uh, in particular, how do you see competition developing in the absence of the requirement to accept all writers? I'm sorry, say that again? How do I see? If the pros no longer accept all writers, especially early in their career, how do you see competition developing or what the effect might be without that? Well, I, think, I think it would be a huge effect. Um, you know, the importance of joining a PRO at the start of your career, it's like it's the first step to becoming a professional songwriter, uh, which certainly went for me. Um, you know, there, it, there's this elusive real music industry, and when you link up with your PRO, they're supportive. Uh, it's a home base. There are people there who have knowledge, and as you're navigating this industry, you know, especially when you're new, you're at a point in time where you ne know next to nothing, and you know basically no one, so they really become your home base. They can help you network, meet publishers, meet co-writers, music supervisors, label people. Um, it's it's a springboard. Um, uh, it even connect you with major artists. Um, so that being said, I I do think that ASCAP and BMI should continue to accept songwriters, uh, all songwriters. Um, if there are costs associated with that requirement, PRO should absolutely be able to to recoup that. Um, and that's pretty much what I have to say about that. Jordan. Uh, Bart, did you want to jump in? You yeah, I mean, uh, to echo what Jack said, joining a PRO is really the start of the career path for every songwriter. It's sort of a badge of honor, and it's one of those career steps that lends legitimacy to I am a professional songwriter, and it's part of every songwriter and composer's journey. Um, but yes, with a view toward cost efficiency, ASCAP and BMI still should be required to accept all new songwriters and composers. So any modifications to the decree should not leave out the writers who are low earners or the songwriters no one would be interested in competing for. ASCAP and BMI have thousands and thousands of members who don't earn enough in royalties to offset the cost of collecting those royalties. And right now, they come out of the pockets of other songwriters. But what happens to them in the future, entry-level songwriters um, who are denied membership because of low earnings, if that scenario evolved, you know, they'd never get the incentive or encouragement to continue to pursue their career path, and that would just hurt the future of American music. So there should be special consideration also given to longtime members. When a songwriter's earnings diminish over time, or when a writer dies and their royalties are being distributed to their heirs, there should be some special views about why they can't be dropped under many scenarios. 
So at the end of the day, PROs are going to have to balance the cost of collecting royalties with maintaining a PRO home for low earners, and we believe there's ways to do that. Well, uh, Clara, uh, in the absence of the requirement to accept all, mem all songwriters members, how would ASCAP behave differently? Why, what changes would you make? Or would you continue to take all songwriters? Well, obviously with the decree and the requirement, it's not a consideration that we would uh, seriously consider until the uh, restriction were lifted. Um, no doubt ASCAP and the MI incur costs to provide services uh, for its members and affiliates. And um, the requirement to take all comers uh, does increase the cost base of ASCAP and BMI, uh, but it creates an uh, imbalance in the in the marketplace because there are unregulated PROs don't have the same obligation. And speaking for ASCAP, we do welcome all new songwriters, and we recognize that some will go on to be successful and some will go on to be super successful, and we want them to continue to stay members of ASCAP but we recognize they don't have to. Um, there's more competition today for PROs than ever existed before. In addition to the two regulated PROs, there's CSAC and GMR and uh, new fledgling PROs that seem to pop up every day. And they're not subject to the same uh, restriction. And we don't think that that makes sense. Um, in fact, some of our competitors um, think that it's a, uh, market advantage to be able to say that they're elite and invitation only. Um, and, you know, the, the, we would just like a level playing field in terms of being able to compete. And, um, you know, maybe the answer is all PROs should have this obligation. Uh, but, you know, I think that that from an antitrust policy perspective, that doesn't really make any sense. And this rule actually is a little upside down because the original ASCAP decree was established to put restrictions on ASCAP and BMI because they were too big. And what this rule does is ensure that they only continue to become bigger and bigger. And as uh, far as I understand uh, current antitrust law, there are no professional associations um, you know, with even more members or more market concentrations that are required to take all members. Wait, so you would not take all members? Or you would, I didn't quite follow. Well, we would okay. do what would make the most sense for the organization and for the music uh, industry. I mean, we, we are a membership association, so, um, you know, we are not concerned that ASCAP won't be responsive to our members uh, songwriters and publishers if the rules go away because in fact we are uh, governed by a board of directors, 12 writers, 12 publishers that are elected every two years by the membership solely for the purpose of representing their interests. Um, we have a lot to cover so I'm just going to skip I, the questions. Oh. Can, I, yeah. can I just follow up? Yeah. Um, just to kind of zoom in, Clara, um, I know that there must have been an impetus for the idea of changing the obligation to keep members. Is there, is there just a group of members that, that, or, or a class or a certain level that, that created this discussion to begin with, or is it just the principle that if others don't have to, we shouldn't either? It's very much the principle that we have to compete with other PROs who do not have the same obligation and you know, want to take our members only after they've become uh, extremely successful and have been nurtured by ASCAP and BMI. Um, and you know, as a more broad uh, matter, you know, the, our uh, <clears throat> view about the decrees is that we should be moving towards the free market and having less regulations. That doesn't mean that we won't do what our members want us to do. It just means that the government isn't telling us that we have to do it. I'm just trying to figure out how that affects competition by allowing new members somewhere to go. I feel like it would create more competition in that you are kind of the nurturing ground for new writers. And then as they grow, they can choose to stay with ASCAP. I have many clients who have been career 
um, as cap writers and, and would never dream of leaving. But I'm, you know, I'm just looking at the alternative of, of a real issue of writers not having anywhere to go. And that's, you know, the reality of it that would be, I mean, if you have that right, you probably use it in some fashion. Um, I'm just trying to balance, you know, one with the other and see, you know, how, you know, how, how they kind of, how they balance. So that was kind of the, the, the but, basic thing I asked. You know, the discussion is an antitrust discussion. I don't really see what the pro-competitive argument for requiring um, free market entities to take on customers or members. Mm -hmm. It, you know, why why perpetuate through the consent decree a market that's imbalanced? Well, I mean, I guess the answer to that question is only because it's been that way for so long and we've, we have a thriving market. Um, you know, the, if it ain't broke, don't fix it adage comes to mind. But that's, you know, that's really it. It could, it could, um, it could hurt in some fashion. It depends on how it's used, I guess. So, Clara, can the pros charge uh, songwriters who don't make enough in royalty payments to really be worth the cost of keeping them on the rolls? Uh, it, it might be. It, it might be um, something that we would consider. Um, you know, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. You know, this one is not something. As I said, we do welcome all new members. In fact. You know, it's the music business. You don't know who's going to become the most uh, successful um, songwriter until they become the most successful songwriter. Um, you know, but as a as a competitive um, matter, we don't think that you know certain PROs should be allowed to pick and choose who their members are based on who they think will be most profitable for them. And ASCAP and BMI cannot. Um, it's just not you know. Uh, a level playing field. Well, I, we have a lot to cover, so I do want to move on, but I know Bart wanted to say something on this topic. No, I just want to make sure we get time for closing statements. So. Okay. <laughs> sure, no problem. So um, there, there's a, a bunch of issues involving how long membership uh, terms last, how many years they're in the PRO, how writers and publishers can resign, and they can resign, and the effect of what's called license and effects. So I kind of, there's three kind of goes a group. Um, they're hard to untangle. Um, so maybe we'll just start off with the term length. So in the ASCAP decree, for instance, um, unless there's an advanced payment, the term length is limited to one year. ASC, uh, BMI has different term lengths for writers and for publishers. Um, but how important is it or how does it affect competition to have these term lengths? And maybe uh, I'll start with Dan, uh, I'll start with Jordan on this one. Um, I, well, you know, I, I think the antitrust um, considerations are a bit over my head, but I can speak to the practical um, 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 reactions that songwriters have um, when they are when they learn inevitably of. Uh, how they're able to terminate and, and withdraw rights. We like the year to year. We think ASCAP's got it right on that. Um, we think that ASCAP um, and BMI should should do year to year uh, with simultaneous windows. Um, sometimes your publisher withdrawal window is different than your writer withdrawal window. And um, you, you're you able to send in a, t a termination notice anytime and want to keep everyone here. Everyone on this panel knows this, but it has to be anytime earlier than three months and anytime later than six months from the date of your term, from your termination date. So you have a three month window, two quarters before your termination date occurs to send in that notice. But if they're staggered, then you've just got to keep track of both of them. And I think a lot of writers miss that. Uh, they don't realize that their, their publishing um, entity has to, has to, has to withdraw or terminate as well if they want to remove works. And they also don't know that um, if they have another, if they have a publisher and administrator, that that company needs to also submit notice within their window. So it's up to three different notifications, which could be diff three different windows. Um, and that is hard for writers to understand. Frankly, it's hard for lawyers to understand. I know a lot of lawyers that I ask, oh, when's the termination window? And they only tell me about the writers. 
Um, so it would be great to have a consistent yearly window that every writer can use to terminate, um, you know, every, every level so that they can withdraw their works. And, and we can get into licenses in effect later, Owen, if that's, if that's what you prefer, and just talk about term limits right now. Right. So that's my, uh, my answer. Uh, Danielle, from the publisher perspective, how do these term lengths affect the publishers and how they work with their own songwriters? Um, I'm sorry, Owen. I had a little bit of feedback. I didn't hear the full question. Oh, sure. We were talking about um, the simultaneity of term lengths and how, you know, Jordan was talking about how that might affect writers, but I know you wanted to talk about how simultaneous withdrawal or resignation, as it might be termed, affects publishers as well and how it affects the ability to compete the pros against one another? Um, look, I think, I, I think here I would say we can't really agree in, in a free market where the PROs can, can make their own choices and what's best for their business. That said, I think where we're talking about in maximizing competition for writers, I, I think anything that allows – for a friction. No, I think we lost Danielle. Um, I can finish your answer, Owen, if you want. <laughs> sure, go ahead. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> I like the conspiracy of working together. Go on. <laughs> You're oh, on Danielle's me. back. Wait, hold on. I'm back. I'm sorry. I, That's you know, okay. we're getting some like very threatening clouds here and I'm wondering if the uh, thunderstorms are, but I apologize for that. Yeah, so I my know. point was simply that I think that, um, you know, whatever can be make the movement from one PRO to another um, seamless and frictionless for writers and publishers, I think is what promotes competition the best. And if that means syncing up, uh, the affiliation terms, then that's a, that's a great thing. But I, I generally think that, you know, we should be looking at ways to, to make this a frictionless, seamless process. Thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so uh, I think you, I just want to try to clarify for kind of a response. So why don't the pros make it more easy for publishers, songwriters to do what they want with their their own licenses, their own copyrights to move between the pros. And oh, go, on. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, by getting rid of the provisions, is ASCAP hoping to lengthen the terms, shorten the terms? What, what is the strategy, and how will ASCAP use this new freedom to compete? I think there's a misconception about how the rules work, and there's a uh, some of the issues are being conflated. Um, as you pointed out, uh, Owen, at ASCAP, every member can resign on an annual basis. And uh, publisher members that have multiple m membership entities are allowed to uh, line up their resignation date if they want and pick um, any resignation date that any of the entities have. So we, we do tend to make it relatively easy to resign. Um, the issue about removing works uh, is, a, is a separate issue. Uh, when, when a member resigns, they're allowed to decide, uh, they, they typically decide whether they want to leave their works at ASCAP or move them to the new society. And there are, you know, uh, sort of complicated processes to, to uh, effectuate the works removal, but it's kind of by necessity when you have, you know, 10 million registrations with, um, hundreds of thousands of members, and you have rules that say that, you know, a publisher member has its own agreement, and the writer member has its own agreement with ASCAP, and we preserve the distinction between writer share and publisher share. Um, so we're always balancing, you know, these multiple uh, considerations when, we're, when we set up the rules, but they're not designed to be able to, to make it more difficult. Um, it's, you know, the way that we're able to administer. The other thing I would point out about, you know, the, the resignation, I mean, the work removal process is that it really doesn't come up that often because the custom, the common custom has been that when a member resigns, they leave their back catalog at their uh, then current society, and then they 
into the new society and the new society licenses all the new works starting you know from the time of membership so it's a really it's a relatively new phenomenon where uh, a new society will say you can only come into this society if you bring all your works and you know the, these issues have come to surface so um i, I take it from that answer that ascap is um does not want to modify the decrees to allow simultaneous resignation by, by a songwriter and his or her publisher. I mean, they may be annual, but they may not sync up on the same day, the same month, same quarter, whatever it may be. I'm hearing. Well, if the question is, is uh, I think that you're correct in saying ASCAP doesn't want to add any more rules to the existing decrees. We think that they're already enough. Um, I, I'll chime in real quick, too, about the um, so just to clarify what I was saying is is what I was requesting on behalf of songwriters is that if we do look at revising decrees, um, I guess it would create another rule. Um, but having a coterminous um, date would, would help with kind of the, com the confusion that we've run into on numerous occasions with, and it's not, it's, it's not just ASCAP, Clara. I mean, you're, you're on the call, so we can only ask about it. But it's BMI as well. And mind you, BMI has two years for writers and five years for publishers. So that becomes even more difficult, you know. And I will say also, sorry, I know you want to say something. Let me just say with the removal of works, um, a lot of times it's um, it's not the PRO that's, at least in my experience, it isn't the PRO that's that's requiring it or requesting it. It's It's our clients that – want to bring stuff over because what's happened in the last five, 10 years is the prolifer prol proliferation of the administration agreement. So people now um, are used to being able to move the house, right? They're not leaving one house and leaving all their stuff there to go to build another house. People are used to moving everything over when they move between publishing administrators. So there's been a bit of a sea change of thought in terms of um, you know, taking their catalog and putting it all in one place. Um, and then, you know, at once. Well, but you know that it, it, it's it's an extremely time-consuming effort to move, you know, catalogs, publishers, you know, when they do acquisitions often take years to, you know, actually effectuate the, the transfer. Oh, I know, I know. It's frustrating that it takes so long. There's a lot of people that you got to deal with to do, but it's happening. Operationally, there's just a huge amount of difficulty in, um, you know, managing, I'll just say, the minutia of all of the uh, rights information. And, uh, you know, there's not an easy way out. You know, it's, I mean, it's easy enough to say line up the uh, exit dates or resignation dates or removal dates, but our systems are set up, you know, to deal with the capacity of uh, or the volume of works and members that we have, and we can't just switch it on a dime. Understood. Just to change gears a little, I know there's a reference, a license in effect. Um, so, Jack, uh, maybe you could talk to us about or define what license in effect refers to. Oh, somehow you're not on. You're not muted, but you're not. We can't hear you. Hmm. I can do it, or Bart. Okay. I've been talking a lot. I don't need to hog the space. Um, Who was that question for? Um, oh, oh, so I was just asking Jack, and but I could ask anyone. Uh, any of you can answer this question, really. What, you know, we hear the term license and effect. Can you just define what license and effect does, uh, means and how that affects the movement between PRs? I can do it. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so what it what it is, and Clara, please um, correct me if I'm wrong, <clears throat> but um, it, it when when you do want to remove works um, and you effectuate the termination properly, you got the writer termination and the publisher termination. You're able to uh, uh, remove your works, but only subjects to licenses that are currently in effect. So if you have a five year radio deal and you're in year three. Those, those compositions stay with BMI uh, or ASCAP until the term of that deal is over. And Danielle, maybe you could explain how the license effect also affects the competition for 
for the publisher to move and for the writer to move and, and how it affects your members. Sure, absolutely. I think, look, I think, um, I think that what, what I hear from my members is often simply that more than how long it is or whether they can or can't, it's just, I think that there's a sense of, of a vagueness around um, how they find out what licenses are in effect, the lengths, how long certain catalogs are going to remain at the, their prior PRO. And so I think that the issues maybe center a little bit about around transparency um, or, or maybe, you know, maybe just not understanding where they can get the necessary information to, to best know now that they've resigned and they're moving their catalog, how that'll work and what that timeline will be. What, what kind of a typical timeline is you hear about in the industry for licensing? Is it like a year? Is it multiple years? That might be a better question for Clara. Right, <laughs> sorry. So Clara, actually, I'll turn to you. Um, so, in, you know, Danielle brought up transparency. So in what ways do ASCAP or BMI inform the resigning member, whether songwriter, composer, or publisher, about the works that they have on file and what licenses they're in so that they know when they'll start rolling off those licenses and move to their new uh, PRO that they've chosen? First, there was, there's an important point I want to make about licenses in effect, and then I will get back to your answer. Uh, it, the, the, question, the issue is that uh, it seems to be uh, implied that licenses in effect helps PROs. It actually doesn't. It's for the benefit of primarily music users, and it simply clarifies that if a music user enters into a license with ASCAP and expects that they're going to have the right to publicly perform the works of ASCAP's members at the time, they have that right for the duration of their contract. If there was no licenses in effect, then um, if a member resigned and withdrew their works during the term of license, then the, the licensee would find that they didn't get the bargain, that they didn't get the benefit of the bargain that they thought they had. Um, so, you know, it, and from a broader market perspective, you know, a license that has license and effect assurances should be worth more than one that doesn't. Um, and so it should be driving uh, license fees and uh, better royalties for our members. Um, as far as the transparency point is concerned, we do supply in, um, information for uh, material licenses to our members, but it, it's uh, you know subject to a process because we have to be very very careful because uh, license terms are competitively sensitive information, and under antitrust laws, we don't want to be telling our competitors uh, competitively sensitive financial information. So. We do have to put some car rails around it, uh, you know, what ASCAP, uh, you know, informs their members, our members about in detail. Uh, but as a practical matter, I will tell you that when a member uh, resigns and is getting paid for licenses in effect, which they do always get paid for um, the continued licensing of their work after they leave, um, they get a comprehensive statement. Uh, quarter uh, with their distributions and they can see all of the uh, licensees from whom they're getting payments and um, they will know um, from from their statement. So the information flows them through the statement for the most part to the to the resigning member? At the beginning. What? I wanted to, to chime in because um, one of our members had a, an experience about um, not getting paid on a license in effect after leaving. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, highlight a couple of policies. And I don't know, honestly, Claire, not honestly, not trying to pick on ASCAP. It's just, we just have this information. Um, one is that the last two quarters of a license in effect for a withdrawing member are not paid. And uh, bonuses to a withdrawing member, which can account for about 90%, of total revenue on a format like radio are also not paid after a, after a writer withdraws, but their compositions are still subject to the license in effect. So while there still are payments made, they're, they're pretty drastically reduced. 
So uh, I'm sorry to say though, Jordan, that the information you have is is not is not correct. Um, the 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 license fees under licenses and I know the situation that you're talking about. Um, okay. The license fees were paid through the entire period of the uh, final license, and it's the bonus uh, that that was uh, subject to a four quarter phase out, and um, that's a rule that is uh, you know in our survey and distribution rules, which is you know on our website, and you know. Uh, now we've actually made our website even clearer so that when someone resigns and removes their works, what the consequences are. And one of the consequences is that um, the, the bonus is phased out over um, for radio and certain audio services is phased out over four quarters. You get, you get paid less. Um, so the, the last two quarters, I mean, I'm looking at an accounting, but I, I, I could be wrong. I was provided this. The last two quarters, of any license in effect are paid through to the withdrawing member? Yes. Yes. It, it's it's only the bonus mm -hmm. and it's only if the member is eligible for a bonus and it's it's in the area of um, audio, like okay. radio or uh, over the top. Uh, and Owen, I would say this, ASCAP has made that clear. I would challenge all the PROs to have a bullet point sheet. Here's what happens when you join. Here's how we pay bonus money. Here's how we pay radio money. Here's how you get your streaming money. And here's what happens when you leave. And as I said, I thank Clara and them for making that clear. Um, and I would also challenge the writers. Writers will often come like I'm considering switching PROs and talk to me about it. And they've never read their writer's agreement. So this is something on both sides that we need to understand. This is a business deal. I think the PROs can really make it boom, boom, boom in your face what you're signing, and the writers and their representatives need to explain that better going forward. I agree with that. And also I agree with Clara's point that this it is for the licensees. And, and honestly, while we would love to do away with a license in effect, we understand why it's there and, and we need to provide stability in, in this in this ecosystem. So we get it. Um, we get the reason why compositions need to stay through the duration of certain licenses. Is there any information provided to the resigning person about the length of time for the licenses more than just receiving the, the financial payout, but for how long the licenses will stay in effect for the, the licenses you've already made to users? Well, Ellen, you know that because the uh, consent decree says that uh, music user licenses can't last longer than five years, it's never longer than five years because uh, um, members' works are only subject to um, licenses that are final licenses that are entered into while that member is, you know, a member of the PRO. So you're just saying the songwriter should just said, know that five did, years is the max. Five years is the max, and we do give the information um, when when it's uh, when it's needed or requested, but we do it with some guardrails to prevent uh, you know violations of antitrust law. And, and along Bart's comment, like we would love uh, some sort of understanding as, as to how to get that information. I mean, our suggestion is assuming it complies with antitrust law that when a writer terminates, they understand which licenses continue to be in effect and for how long. Um, I don't know if, like I said, I don't know if that violates antitrust law or not. It seems something that a writer should know when they terminate. And to Bart's point, it will help inform a writer in making their decision. The, the term length of licenses is uh, competitive, the sensitive information. So if like, I wouldn't want BMI to know when my radio license expires, when ASCAP's radio license expires because of Yeah. And Jordan, I would just respond by saying I, I'm not as much about because the license are floating dates depending on a lot of different things when they were made, when the writer's leaving. But I do think there's a way to say here's what happens when you leave. And, and, and ASCAP did make some changes after, you know, um, recently. But everybody needs to just go boom, 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 boom because – I have seen writers' agreements in past years that lawyers couldn't understand. So we just need to make sure that 
that it's understandable, that it's there, and that, and I'm also challenging songwriters to understand it. It's their responsibility too. I'll just note, I think there's a distinction between, um, because I completely understand Clara's point, uh, there's a distinction between other PROs and competitively sensitive information, but um, there's a distinction between them and, and the writer themselves right. who, you know, I think should be entitled probably to information about licenses that include their works. Um, I'll tell you just from my own personal experience, um, with the MMA and, and beginning the, the, the new mechanical licensing collective, that there are audit rights uh, provided to, to uh, copyright owners to audit the MLC um, so that they can audit at any time completely what they've been paid, you know, what the, what the licenses, licensees are. And I think, I think there is a benefit to that kind of transparency generally. To, to the writers who are members of the PROs. Yeah, and maybe there's an NDA that's signed or, or something, um, some process. That makes sense to have guardrails. Um, just some idea of how we get that information. Well, under the four core principles, the skinny decree that the PROs are proposing, what would happen to that five-year limit that you mentioned earlier, Clara? Would that be maintained or would that go away? for licenses to end users. Our proposal is that it goes away. And the, the thinking is that if uh, a music user wants to have a longer license than five years because they think that um, having to undergo renegotiations of a license is burdensome or they prefer to have the stability of knowing what the applicable terms would be for a longer period of time, um, we should be able to enter into that license just like our the other PR, the unregulated PROs can. Well, how would that affect the transparency to the resigning songwriters and publishers? It, it might result in uh, being subject to licenses in effect for a longer period of time. Does anyone want to respond to that? I mean, look, I make deals all the time as, a, as an attorney, and we try to keep terms short. And it's always a balance between the rates you can get versus the length of time. Um, a five-year deal on a license is, is, is a long amount of time. And, and you know, we would, we would expect that even in a free market, those term lengths might come down a bit. I understand that licensees need a, a, a solid period of time to feel secure, um, I think three years is a good amount of time. Um, I think more than five years is, is a lot. Uh, so especially when it affects a writer's ability to withdraw compositions and their ability to get paid at their full rate after resigning and, um, after resigning from one PRO and going to another. So I can just speak to that very quickly. I'll say, you know, we, we argue a lot in the mechanical rights space that the five year statutory period before you know for every rate setting is is too long given changes in the market um and and often when when we do deals at nmpa it is much shorter a year or two but um again in fairness to clara i think they license um a very broad variety of licensees um who probably have um you know, different needs and different market changes, um, you know, digital services, which are the, the types of licensees I deal with mostly, uh, probably have a, an environment, market environment that's changing much more quickly than other types of licensees. And so I suspect uh, enabling a free market will bring in line, you know, how long licenses should be based on, on market circumstances. I agree with both of you that, um, you know, for digital licenses and new, mar new, new markets that, you know, shorter periods are more advisable uh, than for established um, media and platform. Um, you know, we might have a greater leeway because, in fact, like in cable, the rate hasn't changed for 35 years. Um, you know, and, and so... Another example is, you know, bars and grills and restaurants are on a template agreement and they just automatically renew, but they do have a shorter, you know, a specific term. Um, so 
if you're licensing or boiling the ocean, so to speak, and licensing every uh, potential, uh, every uh, music user, you know, um, having some flexibility when it's appropriate um, is, is a good thing. And, you know, in terms of having a level playing field with our competitors, um, it's important. So, you know, we were talking a lot about the transparency and this license effect. What can writers do or publishers do when they are joining a PRO? Can they negotiate those rights up front for the exit rights? Um, do any of you have experience in trying to negotiate either from ASCAP or, PRO, uh, or the other PRO, PMI, about getting these exit rights that we've been talking about? Bart or Danielle, do you guys want to? Uh, I'm not aware of that, possibly. No, I'm, I'm certainly not. I mean, I wouldn't be negotiating anyway, but I'm not aware of that. Yeah, we're not either. Clara, do, does ASCAP ever negotiate with a songwriter or a publisher certain types of exit rights or additional transparency rights? And, um, and, as, as I said, when uh, when members do ask for LIE information, we do give it with the, the appropriate guardrails and process. Um, no, we don't uh, negotiate unique deals for uh, individual song uh, members. Um, you know, the membership ag ship agreement um, is uh, the, the writer membership agreement and the publisher membership agreement is something that's been approved by the entire membership and to be changed, you know, would require an entire membership vote. Um, and, you know, the board has not, you know, adopted any special rules uh, or allowed the leeway to, um, you know, negotiate special exits. Uh, because we don't also, we also want to be, um, you know, fair across the board and not create, you know, exceptions. Um, so it sounds like you, you have to adhere to your membership, but you can't respond in competition from the other PROs. Is, is, is that kind of what I'm hearing? That, in other words, new competition from GMR or CSAC hasn't led to changes in, in membership rights. Well, no, I mean, if, if the board, if the, if the membership wanted the board to consider making uh, rule changes, the board can make those rule changes. Uh, they can't make membership agreement changes, but they can make, you know, the, uh, the rules that apply to members. Um, you know, and again, you know, we're, we're now going into all the minutia of, um, you know, how we should be better regulated, but we really are moving, you know, want to move in the, the direction of, uh, you know, being able to make our own decisions um, based on, you know, competition and free markets. And, you know, I, I understood the DOJ also wanted uh, to move away from perpetuating these old decrees. Oh, yes, we're in favor of competition. And I didn't know if anybody mm -hmm. wanted to talk about how maybe GMR and CSAC out there in the market have increased competition for membership or how it has affected competition between ASCAP and BMI. I just have to add to that point, every PRO has its own resignation rules and its own process for, you know, moving from allowing members to move from one PRO to the other. And because there is competition, um, you know, music creators can choose which PRO they like. If they don't like ASCAP rules, then they can go join BMI. And, um, you know, at ASCAP, a writer can actually effectuate the rules that apply. So, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, we need to rely solely on, in fact, I don't think we should rely on, you know, a consent decree to, to make those decisions. Oh, I understood. I, I guess part of it comes back to something that um, I think Beth Matthews had mentioned earlier today about how, you know, despite the new competition from GMR and CSAC, that uh, ASCAP and BMI cumulatively still maintain quite high market shares in this industry. And I was wondering um, whether competition from GMR or CSAC are, are changing the shares for ASCAP and BMI. Is there a new competition for songwriters because of their existence that is somehow reducing what might, some might say is your, the market power of ASCAP and BMI? There is fierce competition among PROs for, um, you know, a high performing members. 
Well, so maybe you could walk through how, how do you react to that? How does ASCAP react to that competition in the marketplace for competing for songwriters, composers, and publishers? Well, so we, we look, just like any other PRO, we look at uh, the value of the works that, you know, a potential member would add to the repertoire and to the value of our licenses. Um, you know, we, we look at the, uh, you know, the popularity of the member based on the number of performances that that member might have in a particular um, air, uh, platform like radio. Um, we look at uh, other factors like the overall diversity of our membership and uh, the benefits that that member might be able to bring uh, to the organization that are not purely uh, performance or popularity based. So, so is the competition really for, I guess the result of that is you pay advantages for certain artists that might bring something to the table, um, but is there also competition for the contractual terms, for instance? or any other dimensions of competition? Well, as a general matter, um, recoupable advances and uh, commitment to re remain a member to ASCAP or any PRO sort of go hand in hand because if it, an advance is going to be recouped, um, you know, there needs to be a sufficient amount of time for distributions to recoup the advances, you know, need to occur. And so the larger the request for an advance may be the, uh, a longer term, you know, may be appropriate. Did anybody want to jump in before we move on? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I mean, this is, again, like the, the, the whole anti-competitive versus competitive. The way I look at it as, a, as an attorney for writers and um, a MAC member, uh, MAC board member, is uh, writers have four options. Um, for PROs, a, a fifth one just popped up and it, you, it allows writers to look at, um, how performance royalties are collected and paid and how writers are paid from that. And it allows us to dig in deeper because we're seeing more options of, of choice and, and, um, economy, frankly. Uh, and, and based on that, we're learning how this, ecosystem works in the past it's been um it's been hard to kind of lift the hood and, and see and i know that there there are ways to get information that are um you know generally locked up because of antitrust issues but a lot of these writers are operating in the dark and that goes to bart's point like a bill of rights per pro would be awesome like here's what you get when you come here um because i don't think I mean, there's there's some writers that talk to me about ASCAP collecting their mechanical royalties, and it's like, okay, let's stop right there. They don't do that. Um, so it's 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 a it's a complicated topic, and uh, I think the way these PROs make themselves unique and um, and competitive is based on what they do for you in your early stages, and then in your later stages, how much you get paid, and whether and when you get paid. So. Um, it's different for different writers. So, uh, before opening up the floor to, to everyone, so Clara, uh, you know, obviously the PROs are recommending getting rid of the membership provisions. In what ways would this new freedom allow you to compete better and allow you to help rights holders more? Well, as I said before, um, you know, we believe that if when the membership rules as well as the other rules are, are eliminated from the consent decree, we'll be able to respond and adapt to our uh, members and um, music users' needs, um, including, you know, license terms, uh, membership terms, um, you know, and, and other um, rule changes. Um, but, we, you know, we think that should be a matter of self-governance and not, you know, a matter of the, the consent decree. Um, and, you know, I do really think that we have to, if all this, if, um, we do have to take into account that the competition now is much greater and that will, that does drive changes and we want to be able to, to do the adapting that's necessary in the free market. So um, I, I do want to give everyone a chance to figure out what they might want to say. I know we're kind of running towards the end of the panel right now. Um, but in particular, I, 
I'll invite you all to kind of talk about anything we haven't talked about yet about songwriter competition and how sure. the decrees affect songwriter competition and any modifications you would be advocating for, either new provisions or removing provisions, weakening, strengthening, what have you. And uh, just to start off, I'll, I'll turn to Bart first. And Thank you. Him. So I'll make these brief. We mentioned earlier partial withdrawal. In a partial withdrawal scenario, if that's what DOJ decides, it's imperative that the PROs continue to be allowed to administer the songwriter share, and so that's so we can maintain transparency in the money flow, and that's important. Um, we've done this before, Owen, under a different U.S. Department of Justice several years ago. It was not this U.S. Oh, we only DOJ. have one in this country, but go on. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, it was a different administration and a different set of office holders. And in that scenario, despite everything we told them about this issue of 100% licensing, they went ahead and did it anyway. Judge Stanton overruled DOJ and said that's not what the decrees say. I cannot tell you on the street level how devastating that would have been to songwriters. To simply explain it, now songwriters, instead of choosing who they co-write with creatively, the conversation would have been, are you ASCAP or BMI? I can only write with my colleagues from ASCAP or BMI. I say that to say this, and I really do thank um, Mr. Del Rahim and others because this seems to be a very thoughtful process you've undertaken over the past few years. Do not do anything that's going to set off unintended consequences. And I would suggest this. If there are changes you contemplate that we all haven't given input on, particularly let the songwriters group speak to those before yes. you would suggest implementing those. So let's proceed with caution. Thank you, Bart. Uh, Jack, did you want to have a chance to talk? Sure. Uh, you know, I was just going to piggyback on, on what Bart was saying, which is, you know, I think someone at the beginning of this said it all starts and ends with the song. And there's no songs without songwriters. And as such, we really want to be considered. And we want, you know, if if, if something's going to be tackled, um, that have an effect on us, be it, uh, you know, partial withdrawal, um, we want to be, we want to be able to chime in and have a seat at the table and know that, you know, if our income is going to be regulated, we want to have a voice in how that income is going to be regulated or if it's going to be regulated. Thank you, Jack. Um, Danielle, do you want to, was there anything we haven't covered that you wanted to speak about? Um, just very briefly, I'll say, you know, I think, I think we can say there's general consensus that the consent decrees are outdated. They, they don't reflect the state of the market for performance rights today. Um, I think, you know, the NMPA and our music publishers and songwriters would say free market is generally the right way to go and, and will ensure a proper, competitive, um, efficient market and the best outcome here. But again, you know, Clara said before, she mentioned that lifting the requirement uh, to take all songwriters could reduce ASCAP's market share, which would potentially benefit from an antitrust perspective. I will say something like selective withdrawal and allowing music publishers to actually leave a regulated collective to negotiate their unregulated rights in a free market could accomplish the same thing in a much more beneficial and, and, and efficient way. And so I just want to say again, to close this, we are not opposed to modifications to the decree. We believe that modifications and any discussion surrounding those must include um, selective digital withdrawal. And um, I think that's that's where I'll end it. Thank you, Danielle. And, uh, Jordan, any concluding remarks? Yeah, I've got a, just a couple of things. I wanted to reiterate what I said at the beginning of this panel and what Bart and Jack have said is without the song, without the songwriter, this conversation doesn't exist. And it's good to see Bart and Jack on this panel. And we need to see these groups at the table, no matter what happens. The fact that we have been absent in these conversations in the past um, 
is is uh, is is a problem that we have now fixed. I'm glad we're here. Don't do anything that affects songwriters without the songwriter's viewpoint. And if we're going to protect licensees, we should protect songwriters as well. So thank you for your Absolutely. Uh, Claire, I didn't know if you wanted to have a final word. Or... Yes, I would. Um, I, I, you know, everybody on this panel knows that ASPTAP uh, values the songwriter and all of its members, you know, and it is the core mission of what uh, ASCAP does. Um, and, you know, so we, we all agree on that. Um, you know, I, I agree also with Danielle about, um, you know, the benefits of a free market, um, you know, and the withdrawal of rights, um, you know, may have pro-competitive benefits, um, you know, but our judgment is that on balance, uh, if requesting that now escalates uh, the risk that um, the music licensing community will go straight to the hill and demand 100% licensing or compulsory licensing legislation, um, you know, that would not be good for anyone because, you know, we will have to spend a lot of time and money uh, fighting against, uh, you know, more regulation, which nobody wants. Um, and so, you know, our proposal is um, that we agree to some licensee protections that we don't really think we should have to, but we think that they're meaningful and it will provide a bridge um, to allow um, all the stakeholders to make the changes that are needed so that the uh, licensing, music licensing marketplace can actually function um, effectively and robustly without any regulation. Thank you. Well, I want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, good, lively debate this afternoon. And I guess I'll turn it back over to Karina. Thank, thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you, Owen. Great. Thank you, Owen, and the session three panelists for another insightful discussion. This will conclude day one of our workshop.